Hello traders, it's Saturday, July the 1st. This is John Kicklighter, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. Here to give you a market wrap-up for this past week, month, quarter. Uh, and an outlook for what we can expect in the coming week, month, and quarter. Uh, we are at the turning point of a number of very important milestones, just uh, chronologically speaking. The question is whether the time frame actually leads to a significant shift in market conditions themselves. And there's a lot of reason to believe that is going to be the case, although there are some peculiarities in what we're going to get in the backdrop of market conditions, liquidity primarily, uh, that we're going to have to confront first. So what have we had through the end of this week before we start talking about what's ahead? Uh, the docket was loaded. Uh, for a week that was relatively quiet for fundamental, major fundamental event risk, uh, we ended up having quite a bit of volatility. The question is how much of that volatility came from legitimate event risk or uh, data, as you have on the docket, how much of it came from themes, and how much of it was just the nervous, uh, nervous energy of a quarter end. Um, if you were actually looking f uh, to see what exactly the ner that anxiety can actually rot in terms of price action, uh, I think a great example of that is just looking at, uh, I was looking at the quarterly charts here, but if we were taking a look at, let's say, the 15-minute chart of the S&P 500 or the Spider ETF, you can see how much uh, that can do. Uh, let's take a volume reading since we have volume on the spider ETF. You can see that typically we, the weekend is always going to have a jolt of, of volume, uh, but that certainly did live up to the expectations of what to expect in the, in the immediate end of the, of the week. Now, this wasn't just the end of a week, it was the end of a quarter, and those are important times. Uh, this is not just a we have to re remember, and it's. And I have to re remind myself of this uh, very often as well. Uh, I'm not the only type of trader in the market. The opportunistic, shorter-term, uh, technical, fundamental, com combined interest uh, analysis. There are very different participants in this market, including central banks, including uh, standard corporations who have to clear orders uh, through their banks. And that is a very important uh, transaction flow at the end of quarters. So are funds, pension funds, mutual funds, those you know, those kind of large financial institutions that have to uh, do rebalancing at end of certain periods. They usually do it at the end of week at the very you know, fastest. They do it at the end of month, more typically in the end of quarter, uh, happen to be the bulk of funds. So when you get end of quarter uh, transactions. Uh, very very rarely do they wait to the very last day or very last minute, certainly. Um, you have the entire week ends up being a, a time frame to resettle funds to exit positions that need to be exited without uh, triggering a massive market uh, outflow uh, and to rebalance. I think a lot of what we've seen this past week is rebalance, but it does come into the the construct of the complacency that we've been talking about with the S&P 500 and other risk-oriented uh, markets. Oops, I meant to say that as a VIX. We had the shift in monetary policy uh, in terms of where the standings are. The dollar is no longer simply feeding off of the uh, uh, the appeal that it, it retains as being as the only major hawker central bank. Now we're shifting to forecast for undervalued uh, yield or capital inflow that people can jump ahead of. Uh, that includes the euro and soon may also include the yen. Um, but this is another theme that we've put this construct against. There are competing themes, uh, but the liquidity and market condition are always going to be the first level of concern. If we know we are dealing with a profoundly illiquid market, then to presume a steady advance or decline, a uh, prevailing trend, is beyond unreasonable. Right. Statistically speaking, trying to promote a steadfast trend in a very thinly traded market is almost uh, impossible to do. It would require extreme orderliness amongst its participants, and we know we're in speculative markets. That's not going to happen. 
Now, that's an extreme. These are not ex extraordinarily illiquid markets. These are very, very liquid markets, but they are illiquid to their historical standards, and that will have influence on their price action. Now, of course, what I'm really referencing here is the very significant impact that we're going to have from the U.S. market being offline on Thursday. The Independence Day holiday, July the 4th, is a, uh, is a very considerable market holiday for the U.S. and the world, uh, not because of any particular uh, observance of this on a global basis, but more so because it happens at the height of the seasonal lull in liquidity. This could in some ways be construed as the very uh, nadir of, uh, of inactivity. Now recall, volatility in a seasonal standing uh, hits its low in June. Now, of course, this is only on a monthly basis. The average here is the blue line, the red uh, columns. Uh, this is actually what we had through the end of 2017, these months, uh, since they're all completed. And these are the end of 2016. It just so happens that we we have very specifically followed the, the historical averages uh, for this volatility measure. But we also know that come July, things start to pick up. Now, of course, they wouldn't pick up in the first week of July because that includes July the 4th, which is a uh, holiday that's going to take the markets offline. And since it occurs on a Tuesday, all right, that's going to be a definitive market holiday where U.S. markets, U.S. exchanges are offline. Global investors know and prepare for this well ahead of time. When one of the largest uh, markets, accounting for about a third of total liquidity in the world, uh, is down, uh, the ability to transmit a significant trend, whether it be risk on, risk off, whether it be a very prominent, very uh, aggressive trend in monetary policy, belief, or whatever, uh, it becomes very difficult to actually uh, to move that around the world knowing that you're going to have a big black hole of influence through those uh, those hours. And that takes us all the way up into the beginning of the Asia session, which between Europe close and U.S. Asia open, that is a good 12-hour gap. You can imagine that gives a lot of people time to rethink their interest in building up a bull trend or rethink the panic in a bear trend. Uh, and in turn, it, it acts as a very good firebreak for the transmission of these kind of substantial moves. So this is a known hurdle, all right? You consider it a moat on the market. But also knowing that the U.S. is going to be offline Tuesday and more likely than not, uh, the deep-pocketed investors, the big players, are also probably going to be extremely thin on skeleton crews through Monday. Uh, it is very unlikely that we get that kind of uh, opportunity this session as well. It isn't until we get into Wednesday and on where we know that things fill out uh, and event risk actually in the coming week is quite profound, including uh, FOMC meeting minutes on Wednesday. And yes, that is important because if you recall, the, the rate decision that we had last month was a rate hike as well as laying out the plans for QE. We want more details on that QE plan. This is where we're going to get it. Uh, so this is actually a very important piece of event risk. Uh, we get into Thursday and we know that the ECB's monetary policy minutes, the ECB has, not, has done a not so subtle effort of trying to uh, bait the market into testing how sensitive they're going to be to the world's or one of the world's most uh, dovish policy authorities uh, attempting to uh, tighten or lay out plans to tighten policy, normalize. All right. Now, they've backtracked each time because they've, uh, they've received a little bit of a shock that the markets are not very happy to hear this, uh, but we know that they're taking these steps. It's very difficult to hide uh, when you're otherwise being very transparent or attempting to be so. Uh, it is difficult to uh, kind of contain these expectations. And then on Friday, we have non-farm payrolls. All right, I really focus on the average hourly, average hourly earnings because that's where the focus is for uh, the Fed and policy, and thereby I think that's where you're going to get most of your leverage from. We also have the Federal Reserve presumably going to release their semi-annual report to Congress and, of course, the start of the two-day meeting of the G20 summit, the leaders. 
That is a lot of very high profile event risk. We could easily get into uh, monetary policy standings, monetary policy cumulatively and as it influences risk trends, uh, the political and geopolitical arena, protectionism, uh, that is very easy uh, to charge, especially some of the rhetoric that we continue to get over these past weeks. There are so many fronts in which this market is sensitive, and we have the opportunity to charge it uh, again, that it is almost impossible not to get a substantial reaction from the market. Now, just because you have high-profile event risk, and yes, it does take the next step to escalate to theme, does not mean that we're going to readily get all the way to full-scale and in, in engagement. Uh, so generally, I think we can uh, we can generally agree that uh, when risk trends is involved, sentiment and where investors build up or unwind exposure wholesale, regardless of asset time frame or analysis favor, uh, that is typically the wheelhouse of, the, of sentiment. That's where it's most capable. So I usually think about these themes in terms of escalating to that particular pitch. Um, this is a good opportunity to get there because it does uh, hit upon these themes. It still is not particularly easy to get to the extremes of full-scale deleveraging. Complacency is very, very uh, set in these markets. But we know that inevitably it has to end because if there is not return to be made and risks start to rise, uh, there is a necessity to rebalance or you're forced out of the market. So it is a matter of time. The question is whether the time is this, this coming week. Uh, I would not place my chips on an expectation that we are going to get the full-scale reversal and risk trends for something like the S&P 500 in the week ahead. I don't think that the VIX has a certain uh, opportunity to rise uh, from its extraordinary lows. But the hiccups of this past week, hiccups being risk aversion, the sharp moves uh, through Thursday for global equity drop and uh, the surge in the volatility measures, although this was not an evenly distributed sentiment-based move, seems to be very concentrated in U.S. assets. Uh, I do think that this is evidence not of anything particular for the U.S., although uh, the the quarter end influences certainly are high profile uh, through that kind of activity. Uh, but I do think that it is more evidence of the uh, side effects of complacency. Traders are just uh, at extraordinary levels and they start to rethink their exposure and they become more antsy, more anxious. And any sign of problems as we had in Thursday and they quickly uh, start to cut as we were talking about this past week, as it was happening, the probability that it turned into a trend into the, the, the close of the week was highly unlikely because uh, you, it's not easy to generate trends, whether they be risk on or risk off, um, into such a thin liquidity uh, condition. And for the derivatives trader, the options trader specifically, this is an opportunity because uh, versus buy the dip on something like the S&P 500, uh, which uh, holding a long S&P 500 through the weekend is always, and through the holiday, is always a questionable endeavor. But inevitably, you have four days worth of time uh, depreciation on a derivative. Derivatives do have to account for time premium. Uh, and those four days uh, are essentially free uh, return because it's not likely to have a big move on the Monday that it's open. The other three days it's closed. So Thursday, traders moved in to take advantage of that big swell in volatility, knowing that it was unlikely to, to hold up. And uh, for the professional options trader, the short side traders, uh, that was uh, an easy trade and something of most likely a windfall. Uh, I would not be surprised to find out that there was probably some baiting uh, going on in that, meaning they tried to, they attempted to uh, charge this volatility and get the markets, the broader markets involved. But that's a separate conversation. 
Now into this coming week, remember, volatility has a history through the month of J July to start picking up and really cresting in September, October. We might be in the, uh, we might be leaving these extremely quiet seasonal conditions behind, but that does not insinuate that structural is going to get uh, better. Uh, we are really deep in complacency and that is difficult to shake off. Uh, in terms of the S&P 500 as a uh, general standard for market participation, market uh, activity, uh, the S&P 500 through the month of July does do substantially better than June. But volume ticks back a little bit. These are lackluster months. July is the low in volume. Uh, but we do have somewhat better returns for this month. All right, so keep your eye on these overriding conditions. In terms of scheduled event risk and potential assets to keep a, a closer tab on, uh, Monday trading, be very cautious. Japanese and Asian uh, trading might be a little bit more uh, uh, capable, but it's probably going to be reserved to short bursts of volatility rather than long-standing trends. Uh, the Japanese data in particular is not particularly good at uh, generating strong moves from the yen or even the Nikkei 225, so keep that into consideration. Though I would point out that the Nikkei 225 has turned into the congestion, whereas as others like the DAX or the FTSE uh, and certainly the S&P 500 have threatened reversal. All right, so that's an interesting kind of uh, a deviation from the norm. Manufacturing PMI for the UK is not as important as the Brexit. Brexit actually uh, comes back into uh, play on Tuesday and Thursday. House of Lords are going to discuss the Brexit criteria and objectives on Tuesday and more of the details throughout that session and the subsequent session on Thursday. So Brexit is a primary uh, motivator for the pound. Pound dollar you can look at, but I'm more interested when it comes to the euro pound. A right, little bit more capable of making moves and not being tied up to the uh, abnormal movement of the dollar. Tuesday, that's going to be the lull, the, the, the very trough of volatility, uh, but that might not restrain something like the RBA. I would say keep an eye on the Aussie USD. Uh, again, dollar is not particularly easy, but uh, you can see where we're at on the technical uh, picture. Uh, but other Aussie based crosses, Aussie, Cat, uh, Aussie Kiwi and Aussie CAD, as I've advocated for before, uh, have different setups on a technical basis. These are this is a short term volatility response, and I think that I I marked this as red because we've seen how there's been a shift in the BOE and the BOC, and not so subtle shift on the ECB, although they're trying to hide it. What about the the most important carry currencies, RBNZ and RBA? They're not going to be left behind. There's a reason that these currencies are amongst the majors. It's because of their high yield. They're not going to get left behind. They're very cognizant of what's going on. Wednesday, when liquidity starts to fill back out, we start a long list of PMIs. We have manufacturing through Monday and Tuesday for a range of countries, but these are service and composite, so the the com combination of m manufacturing and services. Uh, these are important. These are good, uh, very comprehensive overall measures of GDP, so timely GDP readings. I'm most interested uh, for what matters most for that particular country. For example, the PMI for uh, the service sector PMI for the United States is most important because this is the largest uh, segment of the economy by far, about three quarters of GDP and in, in employment. Uh, so we have to watch that very closely. But the FOMC minutes are incredibly important. We want to see more about the QE plan and the ECB minutes are very important. We want to see if they actually discussed uh, exit plans and whether the Draghi walk back is just an effort to try to contain the damage that that they've done for in terms of volatility. Uh, this is going to be a very important distinction of whether we get back down towards 111.50 or up towards 116.50, 117. All right, Euro USD, watch that one very closely this coming week. We have a couple more indicators that uh, are of uh, considerable importance. The pound is going to have a lot of economic-based data, uh, but if you want a concentrated event risk, the non-farm payrolls and Canadian employment figures are very important. Dollar Cat has been very active and has further slipped another support through the end of this week at 130. Uh, but 
I would choose a Canadian dollar pair that's uh, a, a secondary or doesn't have so much conflict. Eurocad might be good. Pound CAD might be good. Aussie CAD, obviously, we've already seen that one. Non-farm payrolls is going to cater to something that is probably a dying light. Monetary policy from the Fed is not going to be the most uh, progressive. We know that it's even uh, hitting its most optimistic tone. It's the other central banks catching up to the U.S. that is dictating where the next move is. And of course, through the end of the week, if the Federal Reserve gives its semiannual report, I, I can't verify this through three sources. I only have two sources. But that would be very important because the n distinction and dictation of uh, political policy uh, on monetary policy views is incredibly important. This is another theme, two themes, that can be connected, like monetary policy and risk trends. And then, of course, the G20 summit, because global policies are going even further bifurcated, and protectionism is a very serious issue. All right, we're going into a new week. Remember, first 48 hours, very illiquid and very choppy. So if you're looking for short-term trade opportunities, maybe the Aussie-based pair because uh, of the RBA and other event risk. But if you're looking for trends and you're looking for conviction, don't expect it until after uh, Tuesday, so Wednesday and on. And be very judicial about what you choose as a prevailing trend. All right. We'll wrap it up here. We'll do our next uh, trading video next week. Until then, I wish you good luck trading out there and a fantastic weekend.